Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereals shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Try this first thing tomorrow. Treat yourself to the breakfast cereal shot from guns. That's the one and only Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Just pour out a bowl full, crisp and fresh, right from the big red and blue package. Add milk or cream, top with your favorite fruit, and dive in. See if you ever tasted anything so swell as these giant king-size kernels of premium wheat or rice shot from guns. Yes, tomorrow morning, enjoy this breakfast treat, Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho, Young Bob Clark stopped his team in front of Red Bannister's cabin on 2nd Street and pounded on the door. The boy's jaw was set. He jammed his right hand into the pocket of his parka and fingered the trigger guard of a forty-five. Well, good evening, Bob. I'm coming in, Red. Why, sure. Come ahead. Have a seat. No. What's on your mind? You know, I just left Holden's office. That's so? Well, I hope there won't be any trouble. Trouble? There's going to be plenty of trouble. Your father must have left enough money to take care of that lien. The note's only for $1,000. He didn't leave any money, and you know it. All that Mom and I have is the claim. That's too bad. But I don't believe he ever signed that note. Oh, really, Bob? He never said anything to us about borrowing money from you. He wouldn't. I agree. He didn't want you to worry. No, I mean that you'd be the last person in the world he'd borrow from. Well, he had no choice. And another thing. He'd never agree to pay back a loan before the spring cleanup, before the creek thaws out and we can wash out gravel. How could he agree to something like that? Again, he had no choice. The note must be paid at the end of the month, or I take over the claim. The note's a forgery. Well, if you're going to claim that, it means a lawsuit. What? Of course. And if you sue, I'll naturally get an injunction to prevent you from washing any of the gravel until the case is settled. How could we get any money to go to law unless we wash gravel? Borrow it, perhaps? Be much simpler to pay your father's note. I've told you we can't do that. It's too bad. Now, listen, Red. It, it looked like an accident the way Dad died. The Ridge Trail's dangerous, and it was a bad storm. He could have slipped easy enough. Everyone agrees about that. I agreed until now. But until now? Yes. Now I don't. You've wanted our claim for a long time. There wasn't any way you could get it with Dad alive. But you figured you could claim he owed you money if he wasn't here to say different. You forged a note. You were the Are one you that... accusing me of murder? Yes. You stupid little fool. I've got a gun here. And I'll give you till I count three to get out of here. I've got a gun too, Mr. C. One, two. No! Red. Are you... You killed me. I... There's someone at the door. What have I done? I... I've got to get out of here. There's a back door. Bob was panic-stricken. He forgot his team waiting out in front. His only thought was to escape, to get out of town. He ran down the alley in back of Red's cabin and turned right when he reached Victoria Street, the shortest way to the creek trail. Even when he had left the buildings of the town behind, he kept on running. And an hour later, he staggered up the slope to the cabin he shared with his mother. Bob, is that you? Bob, what's the matter? I... I think I've killed a man. Oh, son, what are you saying? Killed a man? Yes, Red Bannister. 
Why, what for? You, you can't mean it. Yes, I do. Here, sit down. Uh, you don't really mean it. You can't, Bob. Killed a man. I'll tell you. I'll tell you all about it. Oh, Bob, why? I, I went to Holden's office. He had a note that Red Bannister had given him to collect. Dad's note. At least it looked like his signature. But that's impossible. Your father didn't borrow any money. The note was there, Mom, and Holden showed it to me. If we don't pay it in 30 days, Bannister gets the claim. There's some mistake, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. So I I went to Bannister's cabin. I accused him of forging the note, and then he started talking about lawsuits, and I, I lost my head. I, I accused him of killing Dad. He pulled a gun and ordered me out. I had a gun in my parka. This one here, I, I shot him. Killed him? I think so. Oh. Somebody started pounding on the front door of the cabin. Holden, probably. Oh. He could have followed me from his office. My, my team was out in front, but I ran out the back door and then just kept on running. Oh, my boy, what are you going to do? You can't stay here. They'll be coming after you. But the Where team... would I go if I left here? Anywhere, as long as they don't catch you. Without money, Mom. I have a little. Yeah, a few dollars. He may not be dead. You aren't sure, Bob. Maybe not. I... I'll go into town and find out. You must hide somewhere until I come back. And no. Then... But it isn't safe it here. It wouldn't be safe anywhere, Mom. No, I... I... I'm beginning to think straight now. You can't run away from a thing like this. What... What are you going to do? I'm going to give myself up. Oh, Bob, no. Oh, Bob. An hour later, as Bob trudged down the main street of the town, he saw a crowd of men outside the inn. The shouts that greeted his approach told him that the worst had happened. Ah, uh, Holden says that you shot Red Bannister. Is it true? Is he... Is he dead? You know he's dead. You killed him and ran out the back door. I saw you heading for the creek. I wasn't sure. Now, I, hold I... on there. Better not say anything more. There's nothing more to say. He's confessed. But you said yourself that Red had drawn his gun. Now, this could have been self-defense. The only way to get the story straight is to have a miner's beaten. You're, You're right, Rush. Right. Well, it's perfectly agreeable to me. You can be the chairman, Rush. Well, what's the matter with you? You're the lawyer, Holden. Well, I'll have to testify. Rush is the one for the job, isn't he, Ben? Yeah, You're elected, Rush. So it's up to you to take charge of the prisoner. Oh, all right. Well, come on, Bob. All I right. guess I'll have to lock you. Yeah. All right, Rush. It was nearly midnight on the following night when Sergeant Preston stopped his team in front of the Beaver City Inn. Okay. Rush Logan, the proprietor, had heard his team and was outside waiting to greet him. Yeah, hello there, Sergeant. Hello, King. Hello, Rush. You come from the north, huh? Yes, regular patrol. Well, I'm sure glad you showed up here tonight. Huh? We're fixing to have a miners' meeting tomorrow. They elected me to be chairman. But you can take charge of the trial now. Trial? Unless, of course, you think the accused had better be taken down to Dawson. Well, it depends on the charge. It's murder. Murder? Yep. Sad thing, Sergeant. Young Bob Clark shot Red Bannister. That's hard to believe, Rush. It's true. The boys confessed. Happened last night in Red's cabin. There was some argument about a note. Where is Bob? He's locked in a room inside. He's promised he won't try to get away. You know, we'd like to try him here, Sergeant. There's a possibility it was self-defense. We'd like to see him get every break he can. No, Rush. The government recognizes the authority of miners' courts in less serious cases, but not when it comes to murder. Well, there was a That's time That's true when... in the past. But now the force is patrolling the whole territory. I'll take charge. Well, you're the law, as far as we're concerned. I'll have a talk with Bob first. Why, sure. Come on in. One king. <coughs> the sergeant questioned Bob, and the boy told him the whole story of what had happened the previous evening. When Preston had finished, he joined Rush in the kitchen of the inn, where the landlord had food and coffee waiting on the table. Yeah, sit down and eat, sergeant. Oh, thanks, Rush. Joe's taking care of your team. <laughs> and I haven't forgotten you, king. <laughs> This is for you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, it's a sad thing, isn't it, Sergeant, what Bob did? Yes. I'd better take a look at the body. You'll find it hard to do that. Huh? Why? Red was buried early tonight. So soon? In the pine grove up above the hill. Some of Ned's, Red's men uh, thought out the ground this afternoon and dug a grave. They buried him as soon as it was dark. Did you see the body? 
No, I didn't even hear about it till this morning. It was in the coffin by then. Well, uh, who was it discovered the body? Jonathan Holden. The lawyer. That's right. He'd handled all of Red's business. He was just outside the front door when the shot was fired. Bob said there was someone knocking at the door. Well, I have to talk to Holden. Tonight? Yes. That had better be tonight. Next to the inn, the building where Holden had his office was the largest in Beaver City. And Holden lived in several rooms on the second floor. It was there that the sergeant listened to his story. It was perfectly obvious there was nothing to be done for Red. He was dying. Didn't you call a doctor? Well, there's only Doc Faraday, and he's down in Dawson right now. Oh. I called in Neil and Powell from the cabin next door. They worked for Red. Yes. We made him as comfortable as we could, and then he insisted on my making a will for him. He dictated, and I wrote, and he signed it just before he died. Perhaps uh, you'd be interested in it. Very much. Well, here it is. Hmm. Who is this Michael Brophy to whom he's leaving everything? An ex-partner, I believe. He lives in San Francisco. How much property is there? Oh, cash, several claims. The most valuable being Clark's. Well, that, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the shooting, does it? It was the motive, wasn't it? Well, uh... Well, I think that's all for tonight. Thanks, Holden. Thanks very much. Not at all. The sergeant and king returned to the inn. Well, Sergeant? Rush, I know it's late, but there's something else I must do tonight, and I'd like you and Joe to help me. Why, well, sure, anything at all. Do you have a pick and some shovels around? Sure. What do you want with them? We'll need them when we get up to Pine Grove above the town. The Pine Grove? The place where Red is buried? Yes. But why? What's in your mind? An unpleasant task, but a necessary one. I've listened to Bob and I've listened to Holden. They seem to tell a complete story. It's simple enough. Except for one point. Except for one small question in my mind. And the only place that question can be answered is in the grove above the town. Sergeant. We'll continue our story in just a moment. For a breakfast that's delicious, for a breakfast that's nutritious, remember these three famous words. Shot... From Gun. Yes, Shot from Gun stands for the original, the one and only, Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. These are the giant size, the king size grains of premium wheat or rice, Shot from Guns, to make them bigger and better tasting. Think of it. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are actually exploded up, up, up to eight times normal size. That makes them crisp and tender as nuts in November. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. And as Mother knows, wheat or rice shot from guns makes a deluxe family breakfast that's economical, that's easy to fix as falling off a log. Just pour out a bowl full, add some fruit and milk or cream. Talk about good. What's more, long hours at school and play call for a hearty breakfast. And Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So how about it? The whole family will be getting off to a flying start when you eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. It's never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Get Quaker puffed rice... And Quaker Puff Wheat. Now to continue our story. The northern lights were brilliant in the sky, but the shadows from the pines lay blue-black across the shallow grave as the men tossed aside the frozen clods. Only occasionally was the pick necessary. And in a few minutes, the top of the rough coffin could be seen. This has been faster than I thought it'd be. Keep at it, Joe. You must have thrown the box together in a hurry. Yeah. Won't be any trick to get the top off. I've got the pick here, Joe. I'll do it. Just stand aside. The sergeant pried loose the pine boards that covered the coffin. A moment later, the three men were gazing down into the rough box. The coffin was empty except for half a dozen heavy rocks. Joe was the first to speak. 
If that don't beat all. They just filled up a box with some rocks and pretended they were burying red. What do you think of that? I think the sergeant figured there was something wrong somewhere. That maybe he'd find something like this. Right, Sergeant? Well, it appeared that the only men who had actually seen Red after he was shot were Holden, Neil, and Powell. Hardly disinterested witnesses. And Red signed a will, supposedly just before he died. The signature was too good. Too good? A firm hand wrote it. I get you. Red couldn't have been dying. I had to be sure you can't charge a man with murder unless somebody's been killed. Bob's free, then. As far as we three are concerned, yes. But we're going to fill this grave up, and I don't want you to say a word to anyone about what we found here. You see, there's something else we must find out now. The reason for all this. Where is Red? Why is he pretending to be dead? Yeah, why? And who's this Michael Brophy who's supposed to inherit all Red's property? My suspicion is that Brophy... Is Red Bannister himself? Well, he sure went to a lot of trouble. To disappear? There's some reason behind it, that's sure. Now, remember, not a word about this to anyone. You can depend on us. Absolutely. Well, let's get this filled in. We must leave it exactly as we found it. All right, Sergeant. The grave was filled in, and the men returned to town. The following day, the sergeant obtained the key to the padlock which had been placed on Red's cabin and went over all of Red's belongings, especially the contents of his desk. This might be it, King. It's the only possible clue that I can see here. Check made out to cash for $500. Nothing else on the stud. May give us a lead, King. Now all we need is something that belonged to Red. Oh, one of these mittens will do. For future reference, boy, when it comes time for you to find him. Let's go. The sergeant returned to the inn and held a conference with Rush, Joe, and Bob. November the 5th. Did anything special happen around that date? Do you remember any strangers being in town? November or? the 5th? Why, that was the day we buried Dan. Yeah, it sure was. I remember. Well, when was it that he died, Bob? On the 2nd. Yeah, we had the big storm on the 2nd. He fell from the top of the cliff, missed his footing on the cliff trail. Yes, sir. Who found him? Greg Foreman. Where's Foreman now? Uh, he went to Dawson. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, he left right after the funeral. That's it. What do you mean, Sergeant? Has it ever occurred to you that your father's death might not have been an accident, Bob? It did the night I shot Red. This may be it. I don't get you, Sergeant. A check I've been telling you about. I'll find out who cashed it as soon as we got to Dawson. Foreman, eh? We'll see. Did he give any particular reason for leaving here? Well, there wasn't any particular reason for him to stay. He was just hanging around the cafes. You have any money? Not much. Had he been working for Red at all? Is there any good reason for Red to pay him $500? No reason that I know of. To keep him quiet. We'll see, Bob. I understand, Bob, you're not under arrest. I'm only taking you to Dawson, so Red and Holden will think their plan's succeeding. Do you have any idea where Red is? Nobody was wounded, we're sure of that. So he can't be far away. I'll only be gone for a day or two, Rush. And until I get back, I want you and Joe to keep an eye on Holden all the time. We will. Sure, Sergeant. You ready to travel, Bob? Sure. One King. <laughs> Sergeant and Bob reached Dawson late that night. Bob was left at the police barracks, and the sergeant went on to the bank manager's home. Then he searched the cafes until he found Greg Foreman, a pasty-faced, sharp-eyed individual, and he ordered him to come to headquarters with him. I don't like this at all, Sergeant. I haven't done anything. There's no reason why you should think I have. Sit down. What's the idea? I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, wait. Why, sure, if that's all... What about? I've just come from Beaver City. Jonathan Holden is settling Red Bannister's estate. What? Hadn't you heard? He's dead? There was a check he gave you last month for $500. I thought perhaps you might have some other claim on the estate, and I thought you should be warned. Why, why, thanks. Well, that's right, I do have a claim. He owes me a lot more money. Oh? He promised to pay me $10,000. I see. What was that for? Some property you sold him? Oh, no. It, it was just a personal transaction. I'll go and see Holden right away. What was the 10000 for? Uh, some work I did for him. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll... It was your pay for killing Roger Clark, wasn't it? What? what? Who said that? Who said I did it? It could have been Holden. He lies. It was Red killed him. I saw him fighting. I saw Red hit him, and I saw Clark That's fall. That's enough. You're under arrest. But you can't arrest me. I didn't do it. It was Red. The charge against you is blackmail. You, you mean I blackmailed Red? You can't prove that. Whether it can be proved or not, you're going to jail until you testify at Red's trial. What? You said he was dead. I said Holden was settling his estate. That's all, Foreman. You've told me all I need to know. 
about time you went to work, King. The sergeant headed back for Beaver City the following day and arrived at the inn that night. Rush and Joe were waiting for him. So Red did kill him. Yes. What about Holden? I've been watching him. Anyway, I've been watching his office. He's only left the building once or twice, and then only for a few minutes. Huh? What's on the third floor of that building? Uh, it's used for storage. It would be a convenient place for Red to recover, wouldn't it? You think he's there? King will know, won't you, boy? <laughs> you going after him? Yes. Be mighty careful. Red's a dangerous man, and if he realizes you've got the goods on him, he'll shoot to kill. It won't be an easy arrest, Sergeant. It's all part of the job, Rush. I'll see you later, I hope. Holden was surprised to see the sergeant again, and a little uneasy, but he managed to smile as he offered him a chair. I didn't expect you back so soon, Sergeant. Don't tell me that the date's been set for Clark's trial already. No, Holden. Good, I'm glad. Of course, I'm perfectly willing to testify against him, but it would be a little awkward to get away right now. Well, uh, to tell the truth, I want to consult you about another case. Another one? As an expert on the law. Well, I'm flattered, Sergeant, but I... I believe you know the law of the Yukon as well as I do. You'll find it interesting. Now, uh, here's what happened. A man committed murder. He was seen to commit it by one man. And in order to escape the penalty for his crime, he agreed to pay the witness a certain amount of money if he'd keep quiet. The killer was smart, however. He realized that the first sum of money wouldn't be the last he'd have to pay, that the witness would want more and more. Yes, so he conceived an ingenious plan. And uh, <clears throat> what was that? He decided to die. Well, I, I don't understand. He arranged things so that the whole world would think he was dead. Well, I don't see what he'd gain by such a trick. It would be a poor way to save money. If a man is legally dead, he loses all right to his property. Oh, but this man had a smart lawyer. And he signed a will leaving all his property to another person. Let's say, uh, another identity. With a few forged papers, it would be easy for him to assume that identity and so inherit his own property. Very ingenious indeed. Yes. Did you think of it or did Red? Uh, Red. Why, the case doesn't apply to him. Red Bannister is dead. There's an empty grave up there on the hill, Holden. I swear. You can save that until later. You're under arrest, and whatever you say will be used against you. That isn't true. Not a word of it. You'd better wear these handcuffs while I look for Red. No! There. Here, King. Smell this mitten, boy. I want you to find the man it belongs to. Understand? Find the man. That way, boy. Red, Neil Powell! It's Preston. He's coming after you. Thanks for warning me about Neil and Powell. So all three of them are upstairs, eh? I'm with you, fella. Go on. King raced down the narrow hallway to a flight of stairs at the rear of the building with the sergeant at his heels. But at the foot of the stairway, the great dog stopped short and growled a warning. The sergeant threw himself against the wall as one of the men opened fire, shooting down the steps. The sergeant held his ground until he heard running steps above him, and he knew that the gunman at the head of the stairs had left his vantage point. Where can they be going, King? Must be some way up to the roof. Come on. The sergeant and King raced up the stairs, but at the top, King growled a warning again, and the sergeant dropped to the ground. A ladder led up to an open trapdoor on the roof. The shots came from the opening, and then the trapdoor slammed shut. Once more, the sergeant and King were after the gunman. When the sergeant reached the ladder, he lifted King in his arms. I'll carry you up, boy. I may need you later. At the top of the ladder, the sergeant pushed the trapdoor open with his shoulder and looked out on the roof. The men were gone. You're trying to get away across the roof, King. Come on, boy. On top of the roof, the sergeant could see the figures of Red and the others. The building to the right was one story lower than the one in which Red had been hiding, and they had jumped the space between and were now racing along the level expanse of the roofs beyond. Stop in the name of the law! The men paid no attention to the sergeant's command. Preston and King started after them. Without hesitation, they leaped the gap between the building. Good work, boy. They won't get away from us. But by now, the men had reached the roof of the cafe. One of them pulled open the trap door, and as the others disappeared below, he used the door as cover and fired at the sergeant. Down, boy! Then, as the shooting stopped, the sergeant and King were running once more. They leaped one gap. Then another, and at last they were on the cafe roof. The sergeant pulled open the trap door. King jumped down through the opening, and the sergeant dropped after him. This was the gambling room. Several tables had been overturned, and the walls were lined with men. But Red and the others had run through the room and on. Look out there, sergeant. 
They may be waiting out in the hall. The sergeant threw open the door, but the men had already disappeared down the stairs. We'll take it easy at the bottom, King. I think they'll make a stand there. The bar will be good cover. The sergeant was right. As he opened the door at the bottom of the stairs, he caught a glimpse of Red, Neil, and Powell behind the bar. There was no one else in the cafe. The sergeant stopped to return their fire from the cover of the door. But King never hesitated. The men were shooting high to catch the sergeant. Kept close to the floor until he rounded the corner of the bar and leaped at Powell, the man nearest him. The man went down and King's jaws closed on the wrist of his gun hand. Don't get this dog. Get him off of me. The man had no sooner released the hole on his gun than King turned his attention to Neil, the second man, who was firing at the side. Get him off of me. King hit him and knocked him into Red, the third man. Neil clutched the bar, interfering with Red's aim. Look out. At that moment, a shot from the sergeant's gun caught him in the shoulder. Oh! All right. Up with your hands. Oh, you, you got me. No, Red. Oh, I... That wound won't stop you from being tried for murder. Uh... All three of you are under arrest in the name of the Queen. That right? dog. If it hadn't been for it him... It might have been left to someone else to arrest you. As it is, you're all coming to Dawson with me. You planned your own death, Red. Looks to me as if you planned better than you thought. Good work, King. This case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. To get the famous ready-to-serve breakfast cereals, the original crisp, fresh, wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the big red and blue Quaker packages. The packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Get the one and only delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the doomed witness. A young trapper named Dave Broderick was the only witness against Killer Martin. I knew Martin's lawyer would do almost anything to save the murderer from the hangman, so I told Dave to go into hiding until the day of the trial. By trying to protect Dave, I walked into a death trap. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure... Friday. Boys and girls, does your dog like to play? Is he a good watchdog? Well, if you want to keep him happy and healthy, then have Mom feed him kennel ration. Because kennel ration is made with lean red meat. Choice cuts of U.S. government-inspected horse meat. And it's packed with vital minerals and vitamins dogs need daily. Have Mom get three cans at her favorite dealer today. Look for the blue and yellow can. Kennel ration. First in canned dog food. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat 